Uh, so, what I've got uh, this morning is just a little bit of uh, coaching uh, discussion from some of uh, the things I've taken over the years. You guys are the coaches in the trenches now. You guys are the uh, activity sponsors in the trenches now and doing a lot of things with kids. So, really what it is is just a little bit of food for thought more than anything that I'm going to share. Um, every coach, every sponsor has to have their own philosophy and it has to be set on the principles that you decide for your program. And really that's what I'm going to share. You know, over the years, um, you know, my coaching, my coaching background, although I have not been uh, in the real competitive world of coaching for a long time, it's probably been, you know, thinking about it, 12, 13 years since I was a varsity uh, head coach, so a long time ago, which is kind of blows my mind, but I coached 21 seasons as a head coach of a sport at the high school level, at the varsity level, and then a number of years as an assistant coach, a number of years as a, a junior high coach. So, um, and then obviously youth coaching, coaching uh, the teams that Hallie and Braden played on for a number of years, and uh, some of that with some of you guys, and uh, had a lot of fun doing that too. So what, I've, what I have, what I've taken, what I've used, uh, much of it is built on my own philosophies about what I've learned about the games that I've coached. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of times going to clinics when I was uh, a head basketball coach, and you know, it didn't matter who you were hearing, if you were hearing a local high school coach, or whether you were hearing the Rick Majerus of the world, the Jim Calhouns, the uh, Bobby Knights, you go to all those clinics at the state level, the local level. Um, it really, the goal was to get something, something out of it that you could take back to your program and use, um, and, and maybe you can get something out of this today, or something is just reinforcement about what you're already doing within your program. So uh, we'll just cruise through this. I just put together a little coach's top 10 that helps us uh, and maybe guide the conversation just a little bit. Um, are the lights okay? So your team, your philosophy. I think that's really pretty, that, that's good, I don't know if you want it all the way down, that's fine. Uh, your team, your philosophy, this is really what it's all about. Whether you're a head coach of a varsity sport, whether you're uh, an assistant coach supporting a philosophy, or whether you're a junior high coach or even a sponsor of an activity, not a sport, um, you have to establish a philosophy for your program. And I think really that's what it comes down to is what are the things that lead you to that philosophy? Is it how you grew up maybe playing that sport? The coaches that uh, influenced you? Uh, maybe some of the clinicians that you've heard? Uh, and looking at these three things, and again, these are just kind of uh, spitballing ideas. What will your team do better than all of your opponents? Do you hang your hat on defense? If you're a team sport, uh, if you're an individual sport, you know, do you, do you hang your hat on, uh, you know, we're going to get our, our wrestlers to, we're going to be the best team at takedowns or we're going to do something with, you know, hand control better than anybody else. Something that gets you thinking about what will we do better than any opponent that we play. And it kind of comes down to who's your personnel. What are your kids like? Uh, and that, it could change but you still always have to have something to hang your hat on. Uh, expectations within your program, I think you should stick to those. I think one of the greatest dangers that we have as coaches is changing our expectations, changing what it is that we want within our program. Now, the ebbs and flows, when you, when you coach at a school like Platteview, the size of Platteview, you're gonna have a few ebbs and flows. The ebbs and flows is a lot of, time, a lot of times talent. Talent fluctuation causes a little bit of those ebbs and flows, but um, think about what it is that are your expectations within your program and stick to those. Let those be the kind of the bedrock of who you are. And then lastly is the program buy and I think we're all, of course, doing that, whether it's uh, at the junior high level, as assistant coaches, high school coaches, establishing buy in and making sure that everybody's on that same page. Assistant coaches, of course, we want those assistant coaches to be supporting our head coaches in the program. What are the goals? What are the expectations within that uh, program? Are we going to have to go back and hear a question? Actually, <laughs> why wouldn't you? Yeah, <laughs> that's a fair question. It's one of the Yes. That is an ebb and flow. <clears throat> Sorry. 
Vinny, is that going to do that a lot? <laughs> She's already done. <laughs> no, <laughs> Okay, so getting back to your uh, to the foundational piece of uh, what it is that we do as coaches or activity sponsors, these are just kind of a, a short list, and I think everybody would probably agree that this is going to make most people's, most coaches, uh, top core group of what makes the, the foundation of a program. Uh, discipline within that program, you know, showing up on time, uh, being committed, practicing hard, uh, summer commitment, off-season commitment, whatever it might be, uh, effort and energy. You, you think about what your teams are going to hang their hat on. Effort and energy is something that I would, I would hope most coaches want their teams to really hang their hat on. That's the one thing, no matter what your talent level is, we're going to play hard. <clears throat> We're going to compete no matter what. So I think the effort and energy, you know, and this isn't listed in any order, but I would say that's something that every program needs to say. Our kids, and the great part is at Platteview, our kids typically have always played with great effort, with great energy. We don't, we don't have to go out and uh, demand that from kids that don't compete hard. I think our kids typically have done that, and that's a great quality of our kids. You know, I think about Ashland. Ashland has kids that do the same. They, they just seem to always compete hard, play hard, give great effort. Um, you know, again, I think defense in a team sport, defense is something that you can always hang your hat on. Um, offense is harder. It is a lot harder. Less talented kids can play really good defense. You know, your really talented kids might be really good on offense but defense is something that you can really do uh, and build those fundamentals. Fundamentals, of course, working on skills. It has to be constant. It has to be every day. You can't forget about it. You can't get into the middle of the season and think, uh, you know, hey, we're just, you know, we play another game next uh, Tuesday or next Thursday or next Friday, so we're just going to, you know, prep for the game, go through the motions. Skills and fundamentals, there should be an aspect of that in every practice that you have. Uh, whether it's 15, 20 minutes, whether it's 30 to an hour, 30 minutes to an hour, something to do with those fundamentals and skills that just gets reinforced and refreshed every single day. Commitment, relationships, camaraderie, fun. I think those are all of the things that really, uh, they're the core of good, strong athletic programs. And I think that's what we're all building and most of you have built within the programs that you have. And again, don't just think about this from a high school varsity sports standpoint. Think about this from your junior high teams. When you walk in and, and junior high basketball starting this week, can we build our junior high program on these same principles? This isn't a top-down varsity only discussion. This is about every level because if we do this at every level, the kids come prepped for high school, they come ready to jump into that program at ninth grade, 10th grade, and so forth, and they have these types of uh, core values and core beliefs because they're a part of each program, whether you're varsity all the way down to a youth coach or a junior high coach. <clears throat> this one I think is just key, the relationship aspect, and I, you know, I'm just kind of making a few things up here as we go with the relationship part, but um, it's all about the kids. It really is. It's if you don't like the kids that you're coaching, it's not going to be very much fun. Um, I, I really get back to when I when I coached a lot of the great memories that I have of coaching is the moments okay it's the moments with the kids whether it's after uh, big wins even after tough losses in the locker room uh, it's it's about uh, those team meals inviting kids down to your house the grill outs um, you know, the things that happen within those moments that you'll never forget when the players come back and they say, do you remember when, when you talk about the things that happen with those kids, with those players, those are the fun things. It's building those relationships. I had a, um, we had a team uh, dinner uh, at our house. We always grilled out, I think, before the first game uh, against, we always played Norris the first game of the year, and we had a grill out, and we had the boys down, and uh, I think Braden and Howley were probably – four or five years old and they had those big exercise balls, you know? And so Braden would take that exercise ball and he would run across the basement. He'd bounce off of that thing and shoot himself into the couch and whatever. So one of our players took that big bouncy ball and then we had two of them took that big bounce ball. This kid went about 275, a okay, big old boy. And he ran and the other, the other kid 
had the bouncy ball and they ran at each other. And you know what happens when two of those bouncy balls collide. The, the science of that is some sort of a, an explosion. So the one kid went flying against the wall and he broke his wrist at his house. He was out for the season at our house, team dinner night. Thankfully, he was a role player, but it was still one of those things. But that was, that was not something that was an intended memory, but those kids coming up, they were having a blast playing in our basement, playing with the kids. Um, and it led to something that was unintended, but a memory of uh, those kids. And they still talk about that event today when I see those guys as remember that night. So um, love your kids, love what you're doing with those kids, have fun with the kids, uh, build good memories. <clears throat> You know, what value do you place on winning? I don't think there's many of us that coach that do not value winning. Put it almost near the top of why we coach or what our goals are within our program as we coach. Winning is very, very important. But I don't necessarily agree with the top statement, okay? Winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. Of course, Lombardi's often attributed to that. It's, I don't think he originated it, but he used it a lot. Okay, winning is very, very important. It's again, it's, it's how you're measured within your program, okay? Lay people know your record and they, they evaluate you rightly or wrongly based on your record, okay? Um, based on your wins. But again, what's behind the wins? What's happening within your program? Is there progress? Are you getting better? Are your youth programs going to replace the kids in junior high and the junior high kids replace the kids that are freshmen and the freshmen replace the kids who are juniors and seniors? Are you building a program that's going to win long term? So the winning isn't everything, but if you're doing all of the things right, you all know that that comes naturally or possibly will come. We, again, at Platteview, there are going to be some highs and lows because of our numbers. Small class B school, we're going to have a few bumps in the roads, okay? I coached in an era uh, when we played in the Eastern Midlands Conference, a very, very difficult conference. Class B uh, had a non-conference schedule that included Scott, included Crete, included Ralston when they were dominant. Um, we didn't always have the talent that these other teams had, and we had ebbs and flows. I'm a coach that had uh, two conference championships in a very, very difficult conference. And I also had seasons where we won three games, four games, five games, and I had a zero. I had a zero win season. Go through a zero win basketball season. It's one of the most painful things that you can ever do, okay? We knew going into that season that we were gonna have a chance to win two or three games. We knew going in as a coaching staff, there's only a couple chances. We just didn't have the talent. We were playing three freshmen that they struggled. They would have struggled if they were playing on the freshman team and they were playing varsity basketball, okay? Those were the ebbs and flows, but it was, it was about what we were doing in the youth program or could have been doing in the youth program to build that up. And we have to think about that in terms of a process and a program to get to a point where we can win on a consistent basis, and we'll get a little bit to that later. Um, I used this quote a lot on game days because the process is practice. The, the progress is practice. Um, but when it does come time, to put on your uniform, what are you doing? How do you compete? Okay, on Friday night, uh, when Coach Mack gets his boys in uniform, um, are they ready to compete? Are they ready to play to win? Are they gonna do whatever it takes on Friday night, once the uniform's on, to win? Okay, Coach Speth, game tonight, when the girls put on the uniform, are they prepared to win? Are they going to go out and compete to win? You know, Larry Bird, one of the greatest competitors of all time. What a great statement though. All the process is done, all the practice is done, uniform goes on, dialed in, game time, we go play to win. And I think that's important that your kids have that mentality, you know, wrestling, individual sport for the most part, keep a team score, track, individual sport, keep a team score. But when that uniform goes on, when the track spike go goes on, when they step on the mat, are your kids competing to win? Do they have that mentality that now is the time to win? And that's what these two uh, speak to. And I think you have to put into context, what does winning mean in your program? What value do you place on winning? Is it number one or is it a byproduct of all of the other good stuff, the foundational stuff? 
that happens within your program. And that's what you have to decide. Everybody gets to decide that for themselves as a coach. And I know you all value winning. Anybody that coaches values winning. Um, this is just simple, and this is my belief, and it doesn't have to be everybody's belief, but I want it to be something that everybody thinks about. Again, at Platteview High School, we probably need this more than anybody else. Supporting multi-sport athletes, encouraging multi-sport athletes, creating multi-sport athletes, and the research is abundant on why this is my philosophy. Okay, and again, not everybody's here, but we want everybody to be at least thinking about it, uh, knowing why we need to share athletes from time to time, um, getting it, and for me, I think about it if, if uh, you're not a fall sport athlete, um, but a winter sport athlete, could you encourage those kids to get out for cross country? Okay, just to get some running in, get some training in. Um, again, football season's over, can you get those kids uh, to participate in a winter sport? Um, they, can, they can train for a lot of things during the off season, um, but getting into that sport, and I just think about all of the, uh, the fine motor stuff that has improved by playing a second sport and learning to compete. So I always encourage this. This is my, again, this is my core belief. Um, and we just have to decide if that's something that we can all get on board with. And at Platteview, I feel we need to. So planning for success, it has to be something intentional. It has to be something that we, uh, we do through the preparation of the off season, the preparation of the preseason, the preparation of the week. Detailed practice planning. I have a notebook at home that has nine years of practice plans in it. I kept every single one digital copy and I have a notebook of every single practice plan and every year I flip back through some of them uh, to try to get some of those uh, drills and skills that we need embedded into our uh, practices. Detailed scouting reports. For those of you that are in the team game, especially at the varsity level, this is important. What's your, what's your scout report look like? You know, if you don't know your opponent, you should. Um, and I think in most of our sports, because of how it's played, we have uh, the capability of knowing who our opponents are and knowing what their strengths, their weaknesses, their key players, their uh, go-tos are but having that detailed scouting report is critical for success, okay? It's planning for success. What's your scouting plan before the season starts, okay? One of the things that I did as a head coach is I made sure that I had a plan to get out to see every opponent live and then see every opponent, uh, I, this shows my age, on VHS tape, okay? Um, Zach will explain what a VHS tape is later. <laughs> Um, anyway, that's what I, that's how we did it. And you know, I wanted our kids to see our opponents. It was a lot harder back then, you know. Now you guys can share stuff out immediately. Kids the next morning, you know, the day after games, they've got their huddle video, they're busting through it. You know, the problem with huddle is, is um, everybody's huddle's a highlight as opposed to a, a, a learning tool. We need to make sure that we're using it as a learning tool. How do kids get better based on what they see on huddle highlights, on huddle video? Um, but making sure we see those ch see those things in action so that we can improve our kids. Um, game planning for each opponent. Just because you scout them and know what they do doesn't mean that you have a game plan. Okay, the game plan is likely different for every opponent. If you only focus on you, okay, we're going to get better. We're, I've seen this before. We're going to take care of us. If we take care of us, we'll be fine. Okay, that's that's decent in theory. <clears throat> but every opponent has strengths and weaknesses that are different. What do you do specifically to prep and plan for each opponent? You know, if one opponent, if you're thinking about uh, basketball, um, one team might be guard dominant, you play them differently. One team might be post dominant or have a stud in the middle. Um, you, you game plan differently. You have to think about what it is that are your strengths and weaknesses of your team versus their team and each game plan is likely a little bit different. How you defend somebody, uh, where you want to get up and, and get after them defensively. You know, most of us are uh, kind of man-to-man -man in this building or man-to-man -man principal basketball coaches. Um, so what can you do to incorporate some trapping? What can you do to incorporate some pressure? What can you do to uh, just make opponents 
inferior to your strengths or at least feel a little bit weaker when you put the pressure on them a different way. And the other side of that is, is if your game plan is always changing, opponents, coaches aren't able to adapt as easily or aren't able to figure out what it is that you're gonna do because again, you will have your core values we're going to play man-to-man. -man. That's great. What are you going to do within that man-to-man? -man? Are we going to front the post? Are we going to play behind him? Are we going to double him? Are we going to you know, bring somebody from the backside? There's a lot of different ways to do that, and I think each game's a little bit different. And then defined roles for all members of the organization. What are the assistant coaches doing to prep for this? What are your, uh, you know, what are your student managers doing? Everybody should have a role, and it should be defined. There should be no guesswork in it. Um, and I think, I think that's just something you as a head coach, and again, junior high is a little bit different, uh, youth program's a little bit different because again, the intensity of the program isn't as high, but everybody should have a defined role within the organization and know what it is. And assistant coaches, make sure you're asking what it is. What do I need to do to support you? What do I need to make sure the program's advancing? Know what your job is as an assistant coach or a, or a youth coach or a junior high coach to support the big program. Okay, this can't be overstated enough, the importance of practicing everything. Through the slide, and they all kind of just crash into each other. I mean, look at this. Like, they didn't know which way to go. The coach was telling them or went through the paper. I mean, they took the seating <laughs> belt to get to that bag. That's like, the I wonder if they won the game after this. That thing. was the big question. <laughs> yeah. This, the video this of one was recent, you might have seen. Oh, no. So here it is. The other player made a great interception, but he ran the wrong direction. So there he goes. You see his own guy chasing him down here. He tackled him at the 10. Someone on the sidelines right there is just losing it. That would have been a, a safety. I would have been two points for the other team had he made it all the way to the end zone. I, so he didn't obviously realize it until that point? Okay, now those are obviously right. extreme the cases. Is that the coach on the side? Practice everything and I, and I truly mean everything every part of your uh, preparation for uh, Friday night ball games or big you know Saturday conference tournament games whatever they are practice everything of course you're practicing your weaknesses you know we're struggling to rebound we need rebounding drills okay and they can't be the same old rebounding drills if we've been struggling for 20 games we're going to go back and do the drill that we've been doing for 20 games, but we still struggle at. Change your drill. Look for something different. Hey, if you're struggling to, uh, you know, um, hit the ball in volleyball, if you're struggling to get it over the block, uh, what can you do in practice to get more reps at that? You know, bringing out the broomsticks, bringing out the big hitters, getting that block higher, whatever it is to practice that, different angles. Um, you just have to make sure that you're practicing what it is that you need to improve on without forgetting about all of those skills that your kids need on a day-to-day -day basis uh, that might be their strengths already. So practicing individual skills, we talked about that at the beginning. You have to have skill and fundamental time in every practice, uh, junior high especially. Um, individual skills, you know, when I was coaching junior high, going from varsity down to junior high can be an interesting thing because you realize how bad kids are when they come into seventh grade. Some of them have never touched a basketball. Um, and so when you talk skills at the junior high level, you're talking a whole different thing. So, you know, the, the stuff that you took for granted as a varsity coach, pivot, okay? The term pivot, half of the kids, again, hadn't played basketball. We have to teach them how to pivot. If you say pivot, pivot, and yell at them to pivot, they don't know what pivot means. Okay, you have to teach them what a pivot is. You have to teach them that triple threat position. You have to teach them how to be strong with the basketball. And you have to apply it in a game type situation. Okay? You have to get those kids uncomfortable with the basketball, learning how to pivot, learning how to triple threat so that they can uh, improve those skills because they're going to be out there showcased in a basketball game, not knowing how to pivot, moving all over the place when the trap comes, and they're going to look silly and you as a coach are gonna feel, oh my gosh, and it's gonna drive you crazy, but that's something that you can teach the first day of practice. Think about what it is that your kids need. Um, practice pregame and halftime. You know, that's kind of what that little peewee stuff is, but even at the varsity level, what do you guys do? What is it that you're doing at halftime? 
What is it that you want kids to do before the game? Have you practiced it? Do you go out there on game day and look silly and not have a system, not feel comfortable with where you're at? Um, practice timeouts. What do you want your kids to do when a timeout is called? Scott Frost the other night on uh, at that Minnesota game was yelling at his guys to run off the field. He was livid. Okay, now he was livid because they were getting their tails kicked in. But his kids, his boys, were walking off the field. Do your kids ever walk to the bench during a timeout? Shouldn't. You know, timeout's called. You turn and you walk to the bench. That's on you. You allow that in your program, that sets a tone. Kids should run to the bench. Philosophy, my philosophy, but I think it's probably in the program, if I'd ask Mr. Alexander as an AD, what do you want out of your kids at a timeout? I wanna see all of our kids in all of our programs on all of our teams running to the bench, okay? Once you get there, what do you do, okay? Do you huddle? Do all of the kids get in the coach's circle? Do the starters go sit on the bench during a full timeout? Do you stand up? Do you stand up on the court and the other kids that aren't playing sit on the bench? Drives me up a wall to see five kids standing around a coach and the rest of the kids sitting on the bench. I wonder what they're talking about in that timeout. It's, it's crazy, okay? Practice it. What do you expect during a timeout? Who's involved? How are you involved? Who's talking? We gonna put a bench out there and sit? We gonna get everybody around us? figure it out, okay? Practice bench decorum. What do you expect your kids to do when somebody comes off the, off the court? What do you expect the kids to do on the sideline of a football game um, when, they, uh, when you have a timeout or when somebody gets exchanged or subbed out of the ball game? Okay, and then practice, of course, makes perfect. Not perfect, permanent. Couple more here. Communicate, obvious. Okay, great coaches communicate to everybody. That's to their assistants. Great coaches communicate to the junior high coaches. They're communicating with the youth coaches. They're involved, they're active, they're primary. Okay, you as a junior high coach or you as a youth coach, who are you communicating to? Are you communicating up the ladder? Are you talking to the head coach? Are you asking questions about the program? You know, philosophically, think real quick philosophically about your program and your youth. Okay. Do you need your youth programs to run all of your varsity stuff? I think the answer is no. But you do want your youth programs to understand your philosophy, understand your skill training and development. What skills do we need so that when they do get to me as a varsity coach, they can implement quickly as opposed to teach them those things. Okay, skills at the youth program is something that is the most critical aspect of everything we do. Okay, we have to be teaching those kids the skills that will jump into your program and be beneficial as they compete as a varsity player. And that's on youth coaches, that's on junior high coaches. It's again, communicating up the chain. Communicate with your players, make sure they know everything about the program that's important, that's critical. Communicate with your athletic director so that you know, two-way lines of communication are always open, what are the expectations and so forth. And then communicate with parents. Make sure parents are in the loop. Okay, nothing, nothing can weigh you down as a coach more than parents, okay? It, it's an absolute fact. Nothing can weigh you down more as a coach than parents, okay? Communicate expectations, be clear, consistently talk to them, not talk to them in terms of, hey, let's sit down and chat. Talk to them with regular communications, uh, goals, meetings, uh, practices, game, whatever it is. Make sure parents are fully aware of what's going on within your program or, or on your team. It's critical and it'll take a lot of pressure off of you as a coach. Not a lot to be said here other than um, it's the obvious thing to, to what separates Athletes, oftentimes, you know, the uh, we walked off the field against Wahoo <clears throat> um, in that football game, and um, I know who was the stronger football team, and it's years of history to get to that point. Wahoo has a program where they expect kids to be in the weight room. I talked to their um, principal um, at the game. We talked at halftime, and it was um, it was evident who was the bigger, stronger, faster team. Uh, very early in that football game, but he said they had 54 boys, 54 boys that did not miss one single day of summer weights, okay? That's a weight program. 
okay? It's not opening the weight room. It's a weight program. And if we're going to be successful year in and year out, this has to be a part of our programs is making sure we're uh, training for power, speed, explosiveness, et cetera, okay? We can talk it, but we have to do it. And I'm just ending, ending here. Bill Belichick, um, I'm not necessarily a fan and I'm not advocating that you, know, you should be a fan. <clears throat> what I do love is his mantra, um, his kind of core statement that he uses, and that's do your job. Okay, here's a, here's a guy, now he's had Tom Brady, and he's had the consistency of that for whatever it is, 16, 17, 18, 20 years, I don't know how old Tom Brady is, but he's been around a long time. So it's easier for Bill Belichick to say this because he's been able to exchange some parts alongside Tom Brady, but think about all of the players that have come through that system and he plugs them in and he tells them, do your job. We'll train you up. If you do your job, you'll matter for us. They take some washed ups, they take some has-beens, they take some troubled guys, uh, they take some nobodies and they plug them in and he tells everybody within his organization, do your job. If you do your job, trust in the coach, trust in the system, winning happens, okay? And I think that's really something that you have to look at is within all of those groups that you oversee as a coach, whether it's, a, again, a varsity coach, junior high coach, youth coach, all of those that you oversee, talk to your people about, do your part, do your job. Because if you do it, Andrew's dealing with this in cross country. They go to districts today, okay? He's given every single athlete that's going to run tonight a job, okay? Their job is to go beat the one key member of the other teams that are going to be right around their finishing mark, okay? Your job is to make sure Darren Johnson beats Jim Lynham tonight on the cross country course. That's my job. Okay? He's given them the approach. He's given them the practice. He's talked about it. Do your job. It's a pretty simple thing, and I think we can all get behind that. So with that, appreciate your time. I'm not, I'm not a coaching expert. I'm somebody that's coached a long time, um, somebody that's passionate about coaching. I would get back into coaching very quickly today, um, but not coach any games. I love the youth side of it. I love the skill side of it, the fundamental side. That's what's fun. You know, the games are fun. The games are stressful. Um, that's the part, you know, I've done that. I did that a long time. Um, but teaching kids how to play, how to compete, that's what's fun. Teaching them the skills and fundamentals that, value, that you value in your program, that's what's fun. And for youth coaches, that's what you get to do. Okay? Varsity coaches get the stress of Friday nights. Varsity coaches get the stress of, you know, my, my record and wild card points and, you know, communicating with crazy parents and all of that other stuff. Um, but youth <coughs> coaches get to do that fun stuff with skills and fundamentals. So have a great day. Appreciate your time. Okay. Yeah, it's just a four. I mean, we can do.